Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Jagger from the Australian Drug Foundation. Thanks heaps for joining us today for our first Teen Drinking Law Seminar. Today we're extremely lucky to have Professor John Toombaru and Dr Michael Carr Gregg here to talk about parenting strategies to prevent al adolescent alcohol misuse. Professor John Toombaru is the Chair in Health Psychology at Deakin University. He's published over 220 articles and 100 refereed journal, journal papers. Sorry. His expertise includes health promotion evaluation, drug abuse prevention and community and family level intervention. He's nationally and internationally recognised for his contribution to the prevention of harmful adolescent substance use. Dr Michael Carr Gregg works in private practice as a nationally registered child and adolescent psychologist, specialising in the area of parenting adolescents and adolescent mental health. He is a founding member of the National Centre Against Bullying, a director of the Cooperative Research Centre for Young People, Technology and Wellbeing, columnist for a number of publications and a published author amongst many things. Um, so re regarding today's format, Matt, I'm just going to set the scene briefly and then I'll hand over to John and then to Michael. John and Michael will be talking for around 10 to 15 minutes each and then we've got time at the end for questions. Um, so if you send in your questions as you think of them, we can address them at the end. Secondary supply of alcohol refers to the provision of alcohol to people under the age of 18, usually by an adult person who's not employed to sell alcohol. Under liquor licensing legislation in all Australian jurisdictions, it's illegal for staff of licensed premises to serve minors and for adults to purchase alcohol on behalf of minors, although there are limited exceptions in cer certain limited circumstances. The situation in private residences is less clear as the law differs across the country. In some jurisdictions, the supply and consumption of alcohol in private settings is unregulated and people under the age of 18 years can be supplied with and drink an unlimited amount of alcohol at any age. However, since November 1, 2011, Victorian law has been amended and it now requires that adults supplying alcohol to a minor in their home have the permission of the minor's parent or guardian. The Department of Health has funded a communications and education campaign to support the change in legislation. VicHealth has been given primary responsibility for development, delivery and evaluation of the project and the ADF has been subcontracted to deliver the education component. So this component consists of a number of activities including a website, an online question and answer and discussion forum, a series of podcasts, community forums, a toolkit so people can conduct education sessions in their own communities and a series of webinars. And so on that note, I'll pass you over to Professor John Toombrew, who's going to be talking about the first part of parenting strategies to prevent alcohol misuse. Well, it's good to be joining everybody today and uh, I can't think of a better topic to be uh, spending the afternoon exploring. Very important. Um, I won my stripes to be able to sit at the table here with Michael Carr Gregg by being a researcher myself for a number of years and uh, been very interested in doing longitudinal studies and also raising two children who I'm pleased to say are uh, sort of past the, the age where they're um, you know, at, huge, at, at the largest risk and starting to sort of act quite sensibly, so pleased to see that. Uh, look, I, the, the first thing I wanted to talk about, you see here for this overhead, is looking at the argument for delaying your adolescent's introduction to alcohol. We know that a lot of people uh, haven't been sort of too keen on this idea because um, we know that by the uh, age of 17 in secondary schools across the nation that there's the vast majority of children who report that they are using alcohol and for many of them they've never really had a word from anybody that's uh, particularly for not from their parents to suggest this might not be a good idea. So we do know that there are new guidelines from 2009 that now recommend that adolescents don't use alcohol till they reach the legal drinking age of 18. Um, the message is really pretty strong for the under 15 year group. It's basically fairly black and white. There's um, no real circumstance where it should be supported or justified. But the, the um, guidelines are a bit more slippery around the 15 to 17 and basically what they're saying there is look if uh, the idea here is that if it's going to happen, it's best if it only happens under supervision. I, I, I want to argue today against um, really uh, any sort of slipperiness. I actually think it's better to be pretty um, clear-cut on this. And I, I think that there's pretty good argument to say that we're really not getting anywhere with um, in those uh, households that try to do the supervised alcohol use. We're really finding it doesn't work. Very large follow-up studies in Victoria. We've got excellent data. And what they're showing is that the children who drink even moderately at home 
in those underage periods are more likely to go on and drink in risky settings after they leave, um, after they reach 18, if they've sort of had those training wheels on too early in age. Why do the guidelines say that we really should be delaying? Well, the brain uh, impacts are very important. I think the science has really developed around that. But we also know that antisocial behaviour is more likely if young people are using alcohol. And also, um, importantly, the, uh, all of these um, changes that occur in the brain and the, uh, um, in becoming uh, more hardened to alcohol use will increase your likelihood of being a heavy drinker later on when you grow up. So basically what you're doing is you're setting the scene for more alcohol problems later in life. So there's a, quite a few good reasons. By not drinking, they, they, there's actually an increased likelihood the kids will do well in school. So now there's more and more reasons for um, this message. What can we do if we're the, the adults around young people to try and encourage moderation? Well, one message that comes through the new guidelines is the idea of being uh, modelling responsible drinking ourselves. So limiting, limiting um, our own alcohol use, certainly not getting drunk in front of people. Um, often sort of declining the offer of alcohol, don't think that we have to drink all the time. The drink drive messages are very important. We shouldn't be drinking and driving or letting other adults do so. And we don't want to be uh, getting into the habit of suggesting that alcohol is the only thing that we need for, to have fun or that it's important to have fun. Um, finding healthy ways to cope so we basically don't have to drink all the time. The guidelines are pretty clear. It, we shouldn't be drinking more than two drinks on any, any uh, day on average, and really we should be having a lot of days where we're not drinking at all. And if we can't do that, then I think we've got to sort of start to say, well, um, these, are, these are the guidelines, they're there because uh, they sort of indicate levels of alcohol use that are going to be uh, ensuring that we have sort of greater safety and, and our best health. Certainly four or more drinks is, uh, uh, on, on any one occasion is, is, is not recommended that increases your, your risk of, uh, of having an injury or other problem um, in the short term. So the guidelines have changed. We know that they were, uh, they're, they're a little stricter. As the evidence is mounting, there's more reasons for us to moderate our alcohol use. How do we uh, send other messages apart from just trying to model ourselves around alcohol use? Well, a very important part is actually getting the discussion going. The recommendation here is to really start as early as possible. It's great if we can be uh, talking to our child about alcohol um, before they reach secondary school. And a lot of parents uh, don't think about that, but we do think that it's very important. Um, so trying to have the conversation with young people is often a tricky one. Many pe parents say that uh, the children seem sort of allergic to, to talking and they, they really want to sort of retreat off to their room and be with their friends. They really don't want to be talking to parents. So you really have to um, step up to your full adulthood because uh, it is something that you, you might have to work at a little bit. But the, um, the good news is that uh, many uh, parents do say that they can find ways eventually. And uh, Michael's nodding here because we've talked to a lot of parents about different techniques. One of the messages I always say is, look, um, the children are worth putting time into. So I know that often parents are very busy and they've got huge schedules, but it is something that should be thought about as somewhat of a priority to try to make time available to be with young people at some of the critical times. So often parents say they get a bit of success in getting the conversation going when the children come home from school and how many parents are really there at that stage, but that's a good time. Uh, Often it's, it's a good thing to think of activities they want to do and so as you're driving them along to their sports, etc., often parents say that's the time that can warm up a conversation. One of the key messages is about listening. The more we listen to young people, the more likely they are to, to um, talk to us and so listening is very important. Um, the thoughts of, uh, it's possible to initiate a discussion. Um, you can just ask your young people what they think about the age should be to drink alcohol. Just uh, that's an approach that works. They'll often have an opinion. And uh, you should use these opportunities to make sure they know what you think about alcohol. So that, that suggests, again, that you might want to get informed. And here we are. We're sitting at the offices of the Australian Drug Foundation. They've got terrific uh, information available for you. So I think it's very important that we really do understand ourselves what the risks are before we, we start into the, such a conversation. So I think that uh, one thing that young people will often tell us when we ask them about uh, parents and parents' views, they'll say, you know, 
I wouldn't have any idea what my parents thought about my drinking because we've never had the conversation. So it, these are very important messages. The idea is sort of trying to make sure that you create the opportunity to have the conversation. And uh, often parents say to me what they're looking for is sort of tips of what would I say in different situations. And the good news there again is that there's huge amounts that of information about that provides parents tips. But one uh, strategy that um, a parent used that I thought was you know, quite a reasonable way to do it was uh, simply said, look, you know, I know the last thing you want to, to hear is from you, you, uh, your parents as, as their views about what you should do. But just for the record, I thought you should know that my view is that you shouldn't drink until you're 18. And they put it in those sorts of ways, which is a little bit humorous, but the child did remember that. And uh, the parent was then able to sort of not come across as a great sort of dictator or preacher, but was able to put it on the record. And, and it's very important to do that. I think they do need to know what's on the record. One of uh, the things that I'm very keen on is the idea that um, they know what your rules are. Now, Sarah introduced this talk by saying that the rules are changing and uh, we do know that there's been, uh, there are now new rules about what's reasonable in your household. The rules basically say that, look, it's, not, uh, it's no longer legal to provide alcohol to children in your household unless you have the permission of all of the, those children's parents. That's uh, a different situation than we're in some uh, years back where we know that a lot of parents complained that they would set rules and that, that the community didn't really support them. These rules are there because uh, there, there's a public health interest. We know that uh, as public health advocates that it's in the best interest of children not to be using alcohol through their adolescence. And now these rules are there to say, look, you know, you really do have to make a very deliberate decision if you want to go against the public health. And uh, so you've got reasons why you would um, say, well, look, you know, I don't know that I want to be hosting children at my house to be drinking. Again, our recommendations are that that's not really a good thing to do. There's no, there's no benefit for those children in you um, having uh, underage drinkers in your home. You're unlikely to be able to do what uh, often parents said they were trying to do, which was to encourage moderate use. That's, I'm telling, uh, from what I, I have seen of all of the evidence, we're not successful in doing that by um, trying to uh, coach children in, in, who are underage in alcohol use. What's more likely to happen is they get a taste for it, they then use it more frequently, more often, and eventually they become more hardened to it by the time they reach 18. And so they can drink larger amounts and they've learned habits of use that are, that are getting us into trouble, as I say. So establishing rules. Um, it's good to have rules overall in your home. It's a, it's a discussion that's a reasonable one. Why not ask young people to tell you what sort of rules they think are reasonable? And I think that that's a good thing. But for rules about alcohol, I think that uh, you can have that discussion. If you decide that you're going to allow a little bit of alcohol at home, then I think you also need some rules about uh, what the boundaries are. The issue of consequences is often one that parents struggle with a bit. But it is important to have um, a, a, an early discussion, as early as possible, about what you'll do. What I say to parents on this is that I actually think you have to remember that you are a parent, you're not part of the police force or the judiciary. So it doesn't really matter if young people go and do a little bit of rebelling, that your job again isn't necessary to um, have complete compliance with your rules. That part of their job description is to rebel. So I say to parents, think about this, that um, if the rebellion is going to occur uh, anyway, which is, it, I, I can tell you quite frankly that it will, it's probably better if the rule was you don't drink any alcohol and then the rebellion is that they go down the park and they have a few drinks and they come back smirking because they know they've rebelled against you. Your alternative, if you decide to say, well, look, you are allowed to drink, then the, often the rebellion is going to take a much more escalated form of alcohol and coming home drunken or perhaps even um, having had some injury as a result of alcohol before they know they've really got you because they've broken your rules. So it is, uh, also it's important to say when the rules are broken that you can set some consequences ahead of time. Often uh, the rule might be that you're not going to fund or support any alcohol use. That would be a, a reasonable thing. Or you might reward them if they do go along with you and you might have a sort of prize of uh, some contribution, for example, towards a car when they turn 18 if they agree with uh, your, uh, your rules. So they're, they're my tips of the trade. And... Uh, I'm going to uh, wish you well.
and uh, be here for questions, I think. Fantastic. So now we'll pass you over to Dr. Michael Cargreed. Well, thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, John Toombrew. How lovely it is to work with you again. Uh, and Sarah, congratulations for arranging this uh, uh, terrific uh, webisode or webinar, whatever yeah. you can call it. Uh, look, I think that there is a lot uh, that John has just said, and there are a couple of things that just bear repeating in terms of emphasis. I think it's really important that parents know that certainly speaking on behalf of a lot of adolescent psychologists across the country, uh, we would agree that the teenage brain is a work in progress. You've got 100 billion brain cells, a trillion connections. You've got a, a magnificent organ that is, is actively generating 25 watts of electricity as it just sits there. And we know, as John has said, the science around the impact of alcohol on that brain is not good. My personal view, and one that I've heard the Drug Foundation uh, espouse, is that really we should be looking at a zero tolerance of alcohol uh, until at least 16. I accept with John, uh, except John's view that between 15 and 17 it's very difficult um, to pin people down in terms of guidelines but the supervision is very difficult at that time. Let's be clear there is no such thing as a perfect parent and trying to supervise 15 to 17 year olds is not dissimilar to trying to nail jelly to a tree. It's difficult. However, um, I agree with John about the rules and the regulations and I think it's important that we recognise too that particularly when your kids are getting into the serious end of school, years 11 and 12, alcohol is not their friend. We know one of the impacts of binge drinking alcohol is an impact on their sleep. Now sleep is arguably one of the most important study tools going around. So we want to be very clear that um, they uh, uh, modify particularly their drinking behaviour in year um, uh, 11 and 12. So I guess for me, I think that there is a checklist that you need to have in your head as a parent around reducing the likelihood of your sons and daughters being involved in serious risk-taking behaviour, particularly when it comes to alcohol. Having said that, there's only so much you can do. The truth is random and chaos happens in the universe. But I think that if you listen to what uh, Professor Turnbrew has just said and you take on board some of these ideas, then at least you can put your head on your pillow at night and know that you've done as much as anybody could do to reduce the risk. So the first issue is, are you the world expert on your teenager? And by this I mean you have to understand that there is no one-size-fits-all parenting. What we know is that kids come in lots of different uh, flavours. Remember, there are 23 perfect chromosomes from you, uh, 23 slightly imperfect chromosomes from your partner, throw in the genetic role of the dice, throw in basically the environment, and what we've got is a kid who's unique. So you need to, as they grow up, have an understanding of their particular temperament. Are they sensation seekers, which goes to one end of the continuum, or they, do they tend to be more risk averse? Now the reality is that the greatest predictor of future behaviour in a kid is their past behaviour. So if you've got a child who's basically got a track record of making really sensible decisions, hangs out with kids who also make sensible decisions, then the likelihood is that while I'm not suggesting no supervision, certainly um, you can uh, know that the, the likelihood is that they will make some uh, good, better decisions around alcohol as they grow up. The other question, of course, is how does one deal with the issue of monitoring these kids. John has emphasised the importance of supervision. And I think what I would argue is that knowing where they are, who they are with, and basically what they are doing is critical. And I think if you set that up early on in the piece, then you will lessen the likelihood of getting the response which many of my clients give their parents, which is you are the only parents in the world who demand to know from me the uh, address and the telephone numbers of the mothers that I'm going to visit. Um, and, and you basically have to just clearly understand one of the unique characteristics of teenagers is an inability to predict the consequences of their, react, of their actions. They tend to, to take risks 
far more um, in an adverse way when they're surrounded with peers. So you do need to know where they are and you have a right to do that. And I think that if you set up that expectation early on, then uh, you're probably going to be in a better situation as they hit particularly middle adolescence, which is when it can get rough. The other point that John made, and I think it's a brilliant one, is ar around the lines of communication. Um, and really that is staying connected to your kid. What the research literature suggests very strongly, and certainly my clinical experience backs this up, is that those kids who feel connected to their mums and dads uh, really are far less likely to engage in uh, really dreadful risk-taking behaviour. And I want to emphasise what John said about putting time into your children. I think there are three times which are particularly opportune, particularly in early adolescence, uh, when they come home, when they go to bed, and when they wake up in the morning. I think that is absolutely crucial. Um, and therefore, you should do everything you can to keep the lines of communication open. When they come home, ask them questions about what they've done. Uh, be interested, maintain eye contact, and make sure that your tone of voice matches your content. Kids have an inbuilt bulldust detector. They can tell when they're being snowed. So I think it's very, very important that we try and maintain a level of sincerity. The other issue, of course, is about knowing their peers and encouraging them to be involved in a pro-social network of peers. Now, what that means in English, put aside the psychobabble, is that in my experience, many of these kids who will engage in these behaviours will do so more often than not when they're bored. I think boredom is one of the great enemies, to be honest with you, of uh, parents around Australia. If we can get kids involved in art, music, dance, drama, sport, if we can actually get them to fill up their time, uh, then I think there is less likelihood of them uh, being bored and uh, involving themselves in uh, antisocial behaviour, and particularly hanging out with kids who uh, habitually do that. So I think that that is one of the most important things. And obviously, the great thing about schools, local councils, um, external sporting clubs, even scouts, all of these give young people the opportunity to take those healthy risks. And when they're taking those healthy risks, they're defining, help defining who they are. Because win, lose, or draw, they're going to learn something about themselves. So I think that's a, a, another important protective factor in their lives and something that parents can uh, get involved in early on. I think that's crucial. Furthermore, I think John's point about your attitudes and your values are crucial. I don't want your children ever wondering where you stand around alcohol or, for that matter, other drugs. I think it's really important that you uh, talk with them about what your beliefs are, why you think things are wrong, and right. And John made a very good point about getting yourself informed. Can I recommend very strongly the website www.druginfo.adf .org.au. Of all the websites in Australia, I would have to be saying to you that if you want clear, concise, understandable information, particularly about alcohol but other drugs as well, that's where you go to. That way, when you have a conversation with your kid, you've got an evidence base, you can print off the little fact sheets and uh, you know what you're talking about. Never make the mistake of thinking that just because you're talking about it, the kids aren't listening because they are and they will internalise your views. The other part of this parental checklist is to use the teachable moments from the media and friends' experiences. But the truth is that, uh, sadly, right across Australia, this year and every year, there's going to be an incident where five kids get inside a car, they're going to be drinking, they're going to be inexperienced, they'll be speeding, they won't have their seat belts on, they'll be overcrowding, and it'll hit the headlines. And basically what I need you to do is use those incidences as a teachable moment. Ask them what they would do. Ask them what they would have done to avoid being in that situation. Absolutely crucial. Have a conversation. It's, of course, it's not just drink driving. Any incident. For example, a school in Auckland, New Zealand recently had one of its very senior boys uh, binge drink, get drunk, and his friends noticed that he'd passed out, so they put him to bed and he turned over onto his back and sadly aspirated his vomit and died. Now that is one of those examples which we should be talking to our kids about all the time. Not in a preachy, finger-wagging way, 
but as a conversation. You could always introduce it with what would you have done in that situation. The other thing that I think is crucial is your own behaviour. Kids will absorb your own behaviours. Do you and your partner model responsible behaviour with respect to alcohol in your own life? If you solve your problems by drinking half a bottle of Jack Daniels and a couple of Therapacks every night, you cannot be astonished or surprised if your kid follows suit. So we really do have to recognise that our behaviour is uh, important and sometimes pivotal. The other thing that I'd love you to try uh, and do is talk to kids about how they assess risk. There is no doubt that even the most you know, gorgeous kid will from time to time be in a situation where somebody is offering them something, where they are being enticed to do, do something. What I'd love you to do is talk about your own experiences. Use your past reminiscences and talk to them about how you assessed risk and then ask them what they would have done in that situation. That way, of course, you're giving them the skills, the knowledge and the strategies to deal with the situations when they occur. The other thing is the clear, consistent ground rules. John talked about the rules and the rules have changed and this is the purpose of having this web webinar today. So you need to get uh, really clear, consistent ground rules around what is and what is not allowable as far as your kids are uh, concerned, particularly around alcohol and uh, I'm sure that um, Sarah will give you the website to go to to have a clearer understanding of these rules because every parent talk I do in Victoria this year, I've found that most people have very poor understanding of the secondary supply uh, legislation, so I welcome the opportunity to clarify the rules. Uh, the other thing that's clearly um, important is to have a bailout system. Look, there's some kids who can get themselves into a situation. What I'd love you to do is anticipate that. You could even role play it when they're young so that you can give them the skills and the knowledge and the strategies um, to get themselves out of a situation. A couple of ideas. Uh, make sure that they know that they can ring you at any time, day or night, to come and get them if they feel like they need to be rescued. And you can even do that with giving them a special code word that they text to you and that way, note there's no embarrassment, those parents will just turn up and no one will understand why. And I think it's crucial that you do that. The other thing that um, I, I would probably um, emphasise in terms of role playing is teaching them a, a few refusal skills before the event. There are going to be opportunities where these kids get offered um, all sorts of things, not just alcohol but other things. And I think giving them the opportunity to role play how to talk themselves out of this, um, particularly those situations they don't want to engage in. I remember I always used to tell my son if he was ever offered marijuana, he was to pull his bottom lip down and say, look, I can't smoke that joint because I've got these infectious weeping boils on my lips at the moment and you really wouldn't want to get that. And I just think that that's a, he did actually tell me that he used it and that's just the most gratifying thing to hear. And I think John liked that uh, thing. So uh, to, to conclude, uh, very happy, like John, to take some questions. Please remember that ultimately what your children need is to feel safe, valued and listened to. And uh, if you can do some of the things that we've discussed today, you're on, uh, I think, a good start. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you. All righty, we've got the questions coming through thick and fast. Um, the first one, which I'll throw out to both of you, is, is there Australian research about alcohol and parents, um, which says whether or not parents parents are aware of their ability or which shows that they can develop the confidence to be role models for their kids in relation to their alcohol use? I'll pass that to the researcher. Look, we've been doing a lot of study uh, cross-nationally, um, so the type of research that my team's been involved with, uh, I'll just mention that um, Michael and I worked together for many years at the Centre for Adolescent Health and uh, there was, uh, through the work of many people, there was a, quite a strong research program that was set up in Melbourne and uh, this has had sort of national and international significance. One of the um, legacies of that work has been the establishment of longitudinal studies. So they're studies that follow children over time and uh, they give us really pretty rich information about um, the relationship between uh, what happens early in life and then what happens later and in this case we'd be interested in what happens later with respect to um, alcohol and drug problems. The, the message here is that um, there's certainly very strong evidence that where young people uh, report and describe uh, drinking patterns in their parents, so they describe parents as drinking 
frequently, that in addition to all other things is a risk factor for the likelihood that children will go on to uh, again model that type of behaviour. It increases the risk. It's, as Michael said earlier, it's a lot of random events. Uh, this is uh, what we're saying here is that this continually sort of comes out as just one more factor that maybe we can have a bit of control on. The big news is that we're now learning a lot about parents that set rules. There was great worry that uh, if parents set rules that said, um, you know, you, wouldn't, you won't drink alcohol or I won't, I won't pay for it and I won't uh, allow it in the house, then that the children would rebel and that they would go on to have worse alcohol problems. We're now seeing that that's not the case. In fact, it actually has a protective effect. The children, as Michael said, they, um, they don't come up to you and shake your hands when they think you've had a bright idea, but they do tend to sort of see you as a leader and they will gra grudgingly take on board what you're saying. It creates the internal debate. And are they, again, the parents that uh, really don't offer alcohol in the house and they set a rule that says, look, it really should wait till you're 18, what the, what's happening there is it's having a protective effect. Now, the interesting thing is that protective effect is exactly the same in, in Victoria, when we study children in Victoria, to Washington State, where we have a match follow-up. So the answer is that we, do, we are learning quite a lot. All righty. Um, and Trudy's asked when we might see these laws introduced across other states and territories. Well, Trudy, uh, what I would argue is that there are people like Professor Toombrew and I talking on the media all the time, and both of us are great believers in public policy advocacy, which is basically using the media to advance public health uh, policy that we think will be advantageous. And uh, while today, you know, we're talking to uh, some 26 people at once, when you talk on the media, you're talking to many more policy makers, politicians take note. But one of the ways you can contribute is by writing letters to the paper, by calling Talkback Radio and by raising these discussions. So I think at the moment what we need is uh, an outcry by concerned mums and dads and that will eventually move the politicians. And remember, we've got an election coming up sooner or later. John, would you agree with that? Yeah, look, I think that uh, we, we have to realise that um, every little bit helps. The, um, there was quite a lot of advocacy uh, done by the Australian Drug Foundation. I think Sarah would probably have some views on what other ad advocacy might be done in some of the other states. I guess at the moment what we're um, looking for is to make sure that uh, the result we, we, we expect to see, a, a reduction in youth alcohol use and problems, it starts to show through. And the good news is that in the school surveys we are seeing that, that in the young ages that certainly in the early secondary school period, there's been reductions in alcohol over the last, uh, gradually forming over the last decade. We do actually have um, laws in New South Wales, Queensland and Tasmania. Um, so I think a large part of it is just developing that community groundswell and making the politicians realise that, um, you know, parents are calling for these laws to be introduced. Hmm. Um, okay, what can schools and school leaders do to support parents? I think there's a lot. Um, schools actually have a huge, should have a huge interest in uh, this, this issue. I'll, I'll just make this point. One of the things that we can do as um, advocates for good policies around alcohol and drugs is, again, better inform ourselves as to the uh, reasons why schools sh um, should get on board. So, the, again, going back to the uh, growing knowledge from longitudinal research, what we're finding is that the likelihood of children completing school is reduced where they're drinking alcohol. And they don't have to be drinking a lot for that to actually begin to have this effect. And if that's not in the interest of schools, I don't know what is. So really that type of information is a reason why schools would want to get behind approaches that are likely to reduce uh, youth alcohol use. So I think that it's a matter of trying to understand there's a common interest and to assert this common interest uh, let's speak to those people who we know are the champions for health and uh, education and get together and sort of talk it up, the fact that there's a common interest in this. And I think that's the reason what, how we can get schools engaged. Yeah, I think a lot of parents are looking around for answers to this. And one of the things that John and I did some years ago is we helped Trinity Grammar develop a parenting booklet. And Essentially the genesis of that was a group of parents got together and they really wanted some expert guidance on what the rules and regulations should be. They were looking for an evidence base. So 
uh, John and I helped this parent group put together a little booklet which has now been reproduced many, many times. John, I don't have the exact figures, do you? No, I don't, but I know that it's widespread. So I, I would urge communities to log on to the uh, Trinity Grammar in Melbourne website where they can get information about that booklet, they can get in touch with the people who are in charge of it and um, they can get a copy of this and, and uh, modify it to their own needs and I think that would be a good thing for parents to do. I also want to uh, mention the fact that John Rogerson, the Australian Drug Foundation Chief Executive Officer, recently asked that parents undergo training similar to a responsible service of alcohol uh, course which of course is a legal requirement for bar staff. Now I would have thought that that would have been a wonderful role for schools if such a thing could be created. It would be a wonderful venue for people to turn up to. For sure. Um, what do you think the best method is um, to commence the engagement of parents and young people in discussions? And who do you feel is best placed to do this? Yeah, I, again, I think as community champions that we do have a triggering uh, role that we can play by creating events that highlight some of the issues that we're discussing today. So I think that uh, that can be done through talks in schools or talks in the community. It can be done by uh, trying to engage with schools so that they can do some of the activities that they already have some skills for. They have programs they run, such as uh, one that's called Creating Conversations, where they can actually uh, engage the children to sort of try to bring the parents in. And uh, so I think that as, cha as community champions, it's a matter of sort of putting some time into our schedule uh, to try to make sure that we're doing, spending some of our time uh, generating uh, media inquiries or events that can be this, these points that can start the discussion. And I think that we want to make sure that uh, we are um, stocked with various of the leaflets that are being put out now by Vic Health and the Australian Drug Foundation around this particular campaign. I think this campaign's a good um, uh, touchstone for, for getting the conversation started because it does raise the question why do people suddenly think that adolescent alcohol use is such an issue? Yep. <clears throat> Here's a question that, that's quite dear to my heart. How can we improve parent attendance at forums offered at schools and in the broader community? Because I think people acknowledge that they're a notoriously tricky population to attract. Look, they are and I think that's a fantastic question. One of the uh, techniques that John and I and a young lady called Liz Davies developed many, many years ago when we worked at the Centre for Adolescent Health together was the concept of a quiz night, but it was a parenting adolescent quiz night. And the idea is that parents sit around a table, uh, perhaps they bring a little bit of finger food. We're not crash hot keen on the cardiovascular protection fluid, but occasionally some schools do actually allow parents to do that. But fundamentally what happens is you have an interactive night. So there's a quiz master who stands up and on a PowerPoint puts up some really tricky little scenarios from real life and then asks the parents in groups of eight or ten to consider what their response might be. Uh, after they've done a couple of those questions then the expert answers with rationale are offered. Uh, there's the element of tables competing against one another which is kind of fun. The quiz master is inevitably a very witty, humorous fellow and therefore there's some, in, some enjoyment factor. And in, in many instances, uh, prizes are offered for the end of the day. And I think, John, we found from the research that that was an effective way of bringing parents in. It is. And look, some of the things we've learnt through uh, studying how to engage parents are that you, if you start with events or activities that can involve everybody, <coughs> that may involve um, distributing a brochure or material. It may be the parents' book that uh, Michael talked about. And then if you can have value adding events on top of that, so that uh, if, you can, if, if all parents can receive just some information and perhaps it refers them to a website that they can do something together. And then, so these are low threshold, they might involve lots of people. And then uh, in those forums you can advertise uh, other events where they might have to make a little more effort to attend and then that can lead to invitations to longer sessions where they're going to get intent more intensive help. So think about that sort of idea that you're trying to have layers of information going towards the parents. Thanks, I think people will find that quite helpful. Um, oh, I just lost a question. Can I ask John a question? Am I permitted to do that, Sarah? I think so, Michael. All right, John, 
you did this fascinating cross-cultural research where you looked at a group of kids from Victoria and a match group in, I understand, Washington, D.C. What did you find was the major difference between those two populations, particularly with respect to risky drinking of alcohol? Yeah, so that was Washington State. So they're two statewide samples. And, uh, so, and the reason they were chosen is because there are demographically many similarities. What we discovered was that uh, basically uh, frequent, heavy and even early use is, a, is two to three times as high in Victoria compared to the age match sample in Washington State. And uh, when we examined the influencing factors, the things that we could modify that would have an effect, we discovered that uh, there were quite a few of them that were elevated in Victoria. One of them is that young people are being given the impression that as a community and in their family homes, that there's a favourable attitude towards alcohol, that we think it's okay for adolescents to use alcohol. Uh, the other one is that the availability is much higher in Victoria, that they say that uh, they can get it easily from home. In fact, the supply of alcohol is about two to three times. Uh, by the supply by parents of alcohol to children is about two to three times. When we, as I said earlier, when we actually try to understand whether or not there was some protective benefit in Victoria that might not exist in Washington in the long-term effect on uh, creating a risk for binge drinking as children grow up through adolescence, that's where we discovered that, it, that in fact the risk of offering children alcohol at home and the risk of early drinking were exactly the same in the two countries, even though we had two or three times the number of people, people that do, at, do that in uh, Victoria. So again, we, we've learned an enormous amount about the things that would need to change. So we really need to change that permissive attitude. Supplementary, if I may, Sarah. <laughs> what, what was the drinking age in Washington? Age 21 there versus age 18 in Victoria. So I think that's an important factor. There's, a, there's clear evidence that the drinking age is, uh, again, something that has an effect on the age at which children start drinking. So what we find is that there's a big step up in Washington State at age 18. A lot of children start drinking at 18, whereas in Victoria, what we find is that children start to drink in that 15 to 16 period and they get into the majority drinking there. So that, that it's not that they drink at the drinking age, they actually give themselves licence to start a few years earlier. So having laws and norms that are unfavourable to adolescent drinking clearly is a major protective factor in this instance. Absolutely. Thanks. Welcome. I'm just, I'm just saying that because I think the debate around the drinking age is one that we should keep on the bubble. Absolutely agree with you, yes. And uh, I think that whoever is going to be the Prime Minister in the next couple of weeks, we should you know, all be writing letters and saying, look, how concerned we are about this. Oh, look, no doubt they've logged into our webinar and they know already. Um, another question. Is there data which says parents have heard about the NHMRC alcohol guidelines? Right. Well, we know that these guidelines, are, uh, as I think uh, Michael mentioned earlier, that it's surprising the number of people who really haven't registered that there are new guidelines. Uh, I think that there's two reactions I'm seeing. Um, there's a group of parents who resist them because they don't believe them. And so I think that group of people, uh, what I encourage is more sort of dialogue and more, more in communication about the reasons for the guidelines. People are often um, not aware of why the guidelines have been set and what the evidence base was for the guidelines. So often people are, are not aware of uh, some of the brain research, they're not aware of the associations of antisocial behaviour, they're not aware of some of the, the health impacts on the development of young people. So those are very important. But again, people uh, um, need to take on board the messages for adults as well. And I think that there's a lot of work to do to make sure people fully understand, uh, have the debate, and hopefully eventually that we can get more people who actually uh, buy in to, to those guidelines. I would like to agree with that, and I would like to suggest to you that one of the really clear messages I'm getting from parents is that uh, they feel that the National Health and Medical Research Council guidelines of recommending that young people do not drink alcohol prior to the age of 18 are unrealistic. And they're unrealistic because their children are telling them that even in year eight and nine, they are, they are being offered alcohol. And therefore, I personally think that we've got a dilemma. I know intellectually that that 18 recommendation is very sound and it makes a lot of sense from a developmental psychology point of view, 
The difficulty is that many parents struggle with that and dismiss it. So should we, and I put this question to you, John, should we actually be saying to them, well, maybe we could accept the Australian Drug Foundation recommendation of zero tolerance to 16 and then introduce them to moderate and responsible drinking in association with a meal after 16. What's your response to that? Well, look, I, the way that I see it, uh, I actually think that it's useful at the moment to sort of stay the course through this troubled time because um, I think that the message is gradually beginning to take off, although I, I agree with you totally, Michael, that we're, we've got a problem at the moment. The recommendations are miles from where the population are. Um, but I actually go back to the campaigns around um, tobacco use and I remember the difficult times we had at different stages in those campaigns. And the, think of the controversy when seatbelts were first introduced. You know, we, we often have people who are very resistant and the debate is very strong. But I, I think these guidelines are, are, um, have been carefully uh, developed and I do think that there's very good evidence. In fact, as we've just discussing, there would be a case, very strong case for the uh, public health if the, uh, the legal drinking age was uh, raised to 21. And it fits well with brain science. The evidence is getting stronger every day. So I actually think that we do, that it's a message that won't go away. And for that reason that I think we do have to um, try to sort of encourage people to understand it. What you were saying about the importance of a sort of counter message about harm minimisation, harm reduction is also very important. It's, again, one of the strengths of, of Australian policy is we do have harm minimisation and we can actually talk about these two things. And I think it's, a, a mixed message is important. All righty, we're going to have to wind up there, unfortunately. Um, but thanks to everyone for joining us and big thanks to Michael and John for um, sharing their expertise today. Um, you can visit our website, teendrinkinglaw.vic.gov.au, for further information about um, other activities that we're conducting. Thanks. Thanks very much, Sarah. Thank you.